Hello engineers, welcome back to another video. In this video, we are going to discuss the virtual force field algorithm on a Formula One robot car. The virtual force field algorithm is a local path planning algorithm and it works on the principle of vector algebra. Now, let us have a quick look at its simulation. Okay, so here is the Formula One robot car that we are going to use. In the left, we have the RWIS visualization window. On this window, we are going to see the working of the virtual force field algorithm. And we are also going to see the goal or the final target position that the robot wants to reach. In the right window over here is the simulation of the Formula One car. As we can see, the Formula One robot car is fit with a laser sensor in front of it. The laser sensor in blue extends out in the environment and detects for the objects that are present in the environment. Also, we can see the different obstacles that are present in the course. These are simply dummy F1 cars that the robot has to avoid its collision with. There are waypoints that are distributed throughout this lap circuit. The robot is to follow these waypoints iteratively while avoiding these obstacles present in its path. So now let us run the algorithm and see how it looks. As we saw in the RWIS window, there were three different arrows or vectors pointing in certain different directions. Also, there was a target sphere, the yellow target sphere that the robot was trying to follow or the robot was trying to reach. The red colored vector was the obstacle vector which was trying to navigate the robot away from the obstacles. The green colored vector was responsible for moving the object to reach its target and the black vector was a resultant of both those vectors that gave the final direction the robot car was moving. Also, you may have noticed a subtle zigzag motion in the Formula 1 car. This is a drawback of the virtual force field algorithm which we are also going to discuss in this video. So now let us understand what these three different vectors meant and how they interacted with each other to make the robot move through the Formula One circuit. So let's discuss its technical details. All right, so now let us discuss the technical details of the virtual force field algorithm. Virtual force field algorithm is a local path planning algorithm. The problem of path planning, which is to find a set of configuration that takes the robot from the start to the goal state can be divided into two parts, which are global path planning and local path planning. Global path planning would help us in generating a general path that would take us from the start to the goal state. As an output, it would give us a set of waypoints that we can follow to reach our goal. The local path planning algorithm is responsible for actually following those waypoints. The local path planning algorithm follows those waypoints to reach the goal. Apart from the navigation, the local path planner is also responsible for obstacle avoidance. A local path planner avoids obstacles that appear while it is going from one waypoint to the next. Virtual force field is one local path planning algorithm. The main principle behind its working is to generate a set of vectors 
do some calculations on those vectors and generate a vector that the robot can actually follow. For instance, over here, we can see our robot model and we can see an obstacle present over here and we can see a waypoint over here that the robot needs to reach. The first step is to generate a vector that points from the robot to the target as we can see this target vector over here. Since the robot wants to seek or reach the target, the vector is also pointing towards the target. Second, we have an obstacle vector that points the robot away from the obstacle. As we can see this obstacle vector over here. Since the robot wants to avoid the obstacle, the direction of the vector is completely opposite 180 degrees to the actual obstacle. Once we have these two vectors generated, we can add them using vector algebra and get a final vector that looks something like this. This final vector is the vector that the robot can follow to reach its target while avoiding the obstacle. Now let's see how these different vectors are actually generated. Here we can see that we have a robot car and we have an obstacle in the environment. The robot car is fit with a laser sensor on its head. The laser sensor emits lasers in different directions into the environment as we can see over here. In principle, a laser sensor works by emitting lasers out into the environment. The lasers that hit an object in the environment, they reflect from that object and come back to the sensor. The laser sensor finally returns the distance based on the time of flight or the time the laser took to return to its source. Based on this information, we may know where the object is present in the environment and how much distance away from the robot car it is. We also take a maximum distance threshold beyond which we do not consider the effect of any obstacle. As we can see, these lasers do not hit any obstacle before reaching their maximum threshold distance. Hence, the values for these lasers are taken to be a default value. For the case when the lasers hit an object, they return a distance that is less than the threshold value. We generate our obstacle vector from these laser values. First, we generate vectors corresponding to each of the laser value. Then the obstacle vector is generated by adding up all these vectors. To generate these vectors, we need to consider two components, which are its direction and magnitude. Let us consider these one by one. The magnitude of each vector is going to be inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Whatever distance we receive, we are going to take the inverse of its square and take that as its magnitude. For the direction, we are going to consider a unit vector that starts from the laser and goes outwards in the same direction as each of the laser. Once we have all these vectors, we sum all of them up as we can see over here. Then an appropriate constant is multiplied with the result. Also, we add a negative sign. Now, the vectors that did not hit any object in the environment are going to have a very small magnitude due to the inverse square relationship. The vectors that actually hit an object are going to have a higher magnitude once again due to that inverse relationship. Due to a higher magnitude, these vectors are going to have a higher importance in their vector sum. Hence, the final vector is going to point in this direction. Since we took the negative part of it, the final vector that we have is going to point opposite to it, which is in this direction, pointing away from the obstacle. Generating the target vector is relatively simple. All we have to do is from the target position, subtract the car position. 
this would automatically give us a vector that is pointing from the car to the target. Further, we may also apply some rotation based operations to get the vector to point in front of the car. Once we do all the calculations, we multiply the result by an appropriate constant and we get the target vector. The final vector is simply given by the sum of the obstacle vector and the target vector. Being so simple in the implementation, this algorithm also suffers some drawbacks. The first drawback is of narrow corridors. Consider a narrow corridor as given over here and a robot car is sitting exactly at the center of this corridor. Since the repulsive force from both these walls is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction, the vectors for both of these are going to cancel out. Hence, the robot would be moving in a straight line. However, consider the example where the robot car is placed at a slight offset from the center, as we can see over here. Now, one wall of the corridor is going to be closer compared to the other wall. Over here, the left wall is closer compared to the right wall. Due to being closer, this wall is going to exert a greater repulsive force compared to the one generated by the wall over here, as we can see over here. Adding these vectors would result in the robot car trying to move to its right. However, due to the motion, the car is slightly going to overshoot the center position. Due to the overshoot, the force for this wall now is going to dominate the force of this wall. Hence, the robot car would now try to move towards the left wall. A similar thing would happen again and the robot will then be forced to move towards its right wall. This would result in oscillations and the robot car would not be able to move straight in the narrow corridor. All these oscillations took place because the robot did not start at this exact center of the corridor. Oscillations in narrow corridors is one problem, however, the algorithm may not allow the robot car to enter narrow corridors in the first place due to the result of the different forces. The second major drawback that this algorithm has is that it cannot avoid dynamic obstacles. It can very well avoid the static obstacles which are the obstacles which do not move. However, it has some slight problems while avoiding dynamic or moving obstacles. Due to all these drawbacks, the virtual force field algorithm is never directly used in a real world environment. However, its extension algorithm VFH, virtual force histogram, is quite well used in real robots. Certain other extensions exist to that algorithm as well like VFH plus and VFH star. Alright, so this is all that we had to discuss for the virtual force field algorithm. Now, let us have a brief look at the code. Alright, so here we have the code of the virtual force field algorithm. To run this algorithm, we have used a particular robot software architecture. In this architecture, we have a main loop that runs based on a specific time period. The algorithm does all its computations in those time spaced intervals. If the algorithm completes before its time period has expired, the main loop waits for the time period to complete. Once it has completed that particular time period, then it again calls the algorithm. And if that again takes less computation time, it again waits for that specific interval. Similarly, if the algorithm takes more than the specified time, then the next loop is simply called without any wait. Let us see this in code. Over here, we have the run function and this is the main loop. 
first we get the start time then we call the execute function which is the main algorithm then we get the finish time we subtract the finish and the start time then if the time taken is less than the time cycle the time cycle over here is taken to be 80 if the difference value is less than 80 then we sleep for the time that is remaining Otherwise, if the algorithm took more than the specified time interval, then there is no waiting at all and we simply go to the next iteration of the loop. This is a very common robot software architecture that is quite generally used. Apart from the architecture, now let us have a look at the VFF code as well. Here we have the execute function that is called again and again in our main loop. First, we get all the variables that are required for the computation, which is the current target, the immediate waypoint that the robot has to reach, the ID of the immediate waypoint and the position of the robot. Over here, we set the appropriate constants that we want to multiply. First step is calculating the target vector, which is done simply by subtracting the position of the robot from the immediate next target. Then we apply some rotation operations to get the target vector to face in front of the robot car. This is done by using the yaw or the direction the robot car is facing. After all the calculations, we multiply the target vector with the K target constant. Next, we calculate the obstacle vector. The main computation is as we can see over here, we take the inverse of the square. Also, there is a slight simplification that we take over here. We only consider the X component of the obstacle vector. The X component is also the horizontal component. This is done as for our use case, we have a constraint and a narrow corridor that the robot has to follow. Taking only the horizontal component simplifies the problem and helps us solve it as well. As a last step, we generate the final vector. This, as we can see, is the sum of the target and the obstacle vector multiplied by a k car constant. Once again, as a simplification, we only consider the x component of the final vector to guide us through the environment. The car has been directed to simply maintain its speed in the forward direction. The navigation for the turning is provided by the final vector, as we can see over here. The rest of the parts over here are simply for visualization in the RVs that we saw. All right, so this is it that we had to discuss for the virtual force field algorithm. If you like the video, press the like button and subscribe to the channel for more such videos. And thank you for watching. Bye.